All right, everyone. Um, thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, today we are joined by Lauren Karkova, who is Managing Attorney of the Family Law Unit with Connecticut Legal Services, and also our very own Director of Legal Advocacy, Geraldine O'Neill Wild. Um, so they are here today to talk about the um, Domestic Violence Restraining Order application and process here in Connecticut. Um, so Jerry, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Liza. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, as um, Liza mentioned, Lorraine, Attorney Karkova is with us today. Uh, Lorraine, we're gonna talk a little bit about restraining orders in Connecticut, the process. Um, and we know that restraining orders are one legal option that victims often consider, survivors often consider when they're um, making their safety plan. Um, so we thought it would be important to talk about those today on our uh, Facebook Live, um, maybe answer some questions that people may have, but really kind of go over the, um, the process, what victim survivors can expect. Um, and then two, also any changes that have been made um, to the process because of the current um, COVID um, pandemic that we're all um, experiencing right now, and then what resources might be available as well. Um, so I thought I would just start off by asking you um, around specifics around who might qualify for a restraining order um, and protections. Thanks, Jerry. Um, victims of domestic violence who have been subjected to a continuous threat of present physical pain or injury, continuous thought stalking, or a pattern of threatening, may apply to the courts, uh, Superior Court, Family Court, for a civil restraining order under the Connecticut statute, Connecticut law, it's 46 v. 15. So um, they have to be subjected to those kinds of threats, the, that danger, and the, um, the other party, the person who is um, presenting that threat of danger to them, has to be has to fall under the uh, certain type of relationship that's defined by also by Connecticut statute. It needs to be a spouse or a former spouse, a parent of one of their children or their children, someone who's related to them by blood or marriage, persons other than those um, related by blood or marriage who presently reside with them could even be a roommate, a boyfriend, girlfriend, um, parent persons who live together or persons who have a child in common, regardless of whether they live together, or per persons who are in or recently been in a dating relationship qualify under the statute for protection. Well, and now and there are other protections, obviously, um, that um, people can apply for. Uh, today, we're going to be speaking just regarding restraining orders, family restraining orders, but there are orders also that protect individuals where there's not that family relationship. Is that Yes, accurate? that's correct. So in Connecticut, there's three types of orders of protection um, and the terms uh, protective order, restraining order, um, they get used interchangeably. So there are orders that are entered in the criminal court as the result of an arrest for a domestic violence incident or an assault or a sexual assault. So those are criminal protective orders and those are not something an applicant applies for. Those are entered um, by um, the court against someone, a defendant who is, you know, ha who has been charged with one of those crimes. In addition to an order, the orders that we're talking about today, there are uh, civil protective orders that are available to victims of sexual assault or stalking who do not have a criminal protective order and who do not have the um, family type of relationship as defined by 46B15 against the um, respondent. So there's three types of orders, the civil protective order that we're not talking about today, the criminal protective order that we're not really talking about today, and then the 46B15, which we te tend to call Temporary restraining orders, TROs, or restraining orders. That's what we're discussing today. Okay, thank you. Um, so what types of abuse can a restraining order protect a, a, an individual from? So again, it's um, the, stat the wording in the statute is a continuous threat of present physical pain or injury by another family member or um, someone who the applicant has been in a dating relationship with. The court is looking for, in the paperwork that the applicant provides to the court, um, indication of a continuous threat of present physical pain or phys physical injury. So if there's been an, an incident of 
violence, such as, um, you know, an assault. Frequently with applicants, we, we hear about uh, attempts at strangulation. If someone's been threatening them, um, you know, verbally or through text messages, they've been stalking them. Those are the kinds of things that a victim would want to come into court and apply for a restraining order for. So if somebody just, if there's a situation where um, there's no threat of or no physical or history, um, if somebody, if there's um, emotional abuse, would emotional abuse qualify alone for a restraining order? It, it, these, um, these cases are fact specific, so it's hard to say. Emotional abuse, if it's, um, you know, combined with threats, um, you know, financial abuse. Uh, it, it, it's hard to say whether just emotional abuse would qualify, but it can. Okay, thank you. So what type of um, orders can a judge make when, it, when somebody does apply for um, a restraining order? So a judge can make orders to keep the respondent. So when we're talking about restraining orders, we're talking about the applicant, that's the victim. The applicant applies for the restraining order in the, what commonly is called the defendant in restraining order cases, we also refer to them as the respondent. So you have the victim, the applicant, and the defendant respondent. So a court can order in a restraining order um, case, relief that includes things such as no contact, there can be no contact between the respondent and the applicant, um, that the respondent stay 100 yards away from the applicant, that the respondent be ordered to leave the home if the, two, if the applicant and the respondent live together, that the respondent not contact the applicant. The judge can also order that a restraining order extend to the applicant's children, or if the applicant and the respondent have children together, the judge can make orders about those children, custody visitation orders in a restraining order case. The judge can also order that, um, you know, make orders to protect the applicant's pet, those kinds of things, um, are the types of orders we generally see in restraining order cases. Now, is the process difficult? Um, what would somebody have to do if they wanted to um, obtain a restraining order? What, what does the process look like? Um, before I, I go into that, I just want to um, say the judge can also, if the applicant um, requests it in the application, um, can make some financial orders and um, make some orders about property and personal items. And we'll, we could talk about that a bit more. So as far as what the process looks like, the applicant would, um, and these forms are available online on Judicial's website, and we will talk about the, the, web, the address for the website, or um, an applicant could Google um, Ju Connecticut Judicial Department, and they will, they will, the Judicial website will come up and they can find the forms and instructions right there on the Judicial website. So, they would complete an application for a restraining order that gives the judge certain information, um, the applicant's address, the respondent's address, their, um, you know, whether they have children together, you know, uh, whether the a respondent has guns, ammunition, um, or permits, uh, you know, those kinds of things is what's in the application. Along with the application, the respond the applicant would complete a statement that's in their own words that describes to the court, to the judge, what happened or what has been happening that is, um, you know, getting the, applic the applicant to come into court and ask for a restraining order, ask for protection from the court, from the respondent. So those forms are filled out and then they are um, filed with the court either electronically or by fax or the applicant can bring them in and then the court will um, act on the, the papers or set the case down for hearing or act on the papers, make some orders possibly, but either way if the applicant um, qualifies under the statute based on the, the, the family relationship, the judge will set it down for a hearing within 14 days. 
And you mentioned as far as children. So is, are there any additional documents? You mentioned an application, an affidavit. Is there any other additional documents regarding uh, children that might be involved? Yes, the um, applicant, if they were going to ask for orders or if there are children involved, the applicant would complete an affidavit, an affidavit concerning custody, which tells the court who the children are, how old they are, where they have lived in the past or who they have lived with, whether there's any court orders uh, existing now regarding those children. And um, so that would also be filled out in addition to the, the application, the statement, and then the affidavit concerning children. And I know um, also too, we often get questions from survivors that are asking about, um, you mentioned the application has the applicant's address on it. So say a applicant um, decides for safety reasons to go to another location and does not want that location revealed to the, uh, the abuser or the respondent. Um, how could they protect that address? So there's a couple ways to do that. And um, you know, one thing if, there's victims that are listening right now, I, I encourage them to contact an advocate or an attorney who's familiar with the process or Safe Connect to work with them on the application process if possible. And one of the things they, they would talk about with the advocate, Safe Connect, or an attorney is the, disclosure, the potential disclosure of an address um, because that's part of what we consider safety planning. But if they do not want to disclose their address, say they fled the residence and they're, um, at, the respondent does not know where they are at this point, there's a several, there are several things they can do. They can use um, a P.O. box. They can use um, possibly their work address, a family member's address. If they're um, working with an advocate, they may want to use the um, advocate for the local domestic, the, the address for the local domestic violence center or they may um, complete a form that's available online on the judicial website. It's called a request for non-disclosure of location information. In addition to completing the paperwork for the application, they would fill out this form and they're on the, the form tells the court they're requesting that their address be um, kept confidential. And of course, if a survivor is a participant in the Safe at Home Address Confidentiality Program, that address uh, through the state's attorney's office, I mean, uh, Secretary of State's office can also be used as well, correct? Absolutely. Um, the Safe at Home Program is a, a, a very effective program to keep your location um, confidential. However, most times the applicant hasn't gotten that far yet to have um, you know, connected with the uh, Safe at Home program. So there, there are other options to keep the, the address confidential. So Lorraine, you mentioned as far as um, filling out the forms and submitting them to the court, um, you know, 17, 19 weeks ago, um, survivors would have gone into the court to file uh, the documents. So since uh, COVID and uh, the judicial branch has certainly made um, several different accommodations, um, both in criminal family court, um, what are some accommodations that are made for survivors who are looking to um, apply for a restraining order right now? So yes, judicial has made some very significant changes to the process that are very helpful for victims who need to file. So one of the changes that was made was that previously a victim when applying for a restraining order would have to fill out the forms and sign them in front of either a notary or an officer of the court, and those forms would then have to be physically brought to the clerk's office and dropped off at the court. So one of the changes that the, that judicial made was to the notarization process. Now, if an applicant wants to do this whole process remotely, they can. The um, application and the statement no longer has to be signed in front of a, a notary or a commission of the Superior Court. They sign a statement. Um, they could type in their, their name even on the statement online, and it is their way of saying that they are aware that they're filing for a restraining order, that they're submitting the application, and that they understand that the statement that they made in the papers is um, made under penalty of perjury. So that's, first of all, they don't have to have it physically notarized or 
um, you know, witnessed by a commissioner of the Superior Court. So the, the second step is, that's different is that now the paperwork can be submitted to the court electronically or by fax. And if there's a, um, an applicant out there that's looking for the information on that, again, they can find it on the judicial web page and the instructions specifically are JD, they would go to jd.ct.gov slash home, and then they can find the TRO instructions on how to complete the papers and then submit them, su submit them electronically if they choose to do that without the help of Safe Connect, an advocate, or an attorney. And now with the judicial branch too, I mean, obviously over the last um, several weeks, there's been courts that have closed and now the court is, the judicial branch is swinging kind of the pendulum the opposite way and additional courts have opened up. So if people are not sure of uh, where they should file or what courts are open, um, they can also go to the judicial website as well. Um, there's a list of the courts that are open, um, as well as Lorraine mentioned, the um, the forms that would need to be completed and the email addresses that the um, documents can be sent to. Um, Lorraine, you also mentioned as far as help and referring people to domestic violence advocates at the local program or victims can contact um, Safe Connect, um, which is 24 hours a day, seven days a week at 1-888-774-2900. And the Safe, um, Safe Connect coordinators can also assist with the application process, submitting it, the applications for survivors um, electronically as well. Right. Um, so Lorraine, once the application is filed, and you mentioned that a judge can either then grant an ex parte, an emergency order, um, and a hearing date, or just a hearing date. So then what happens when after that judge makes the decision? There's, how, how does the other party know about the order, order or the hearing date? Okay, so one of the things I didn't mention is that, so the application and the statement get filed with the court, and that is called an ex parte um, restraining order application. And what that means is that the applicant has filed it, knows about it, but the respondent doesn't know about it. It's just one party. So the, the paperwork comes back to the applicant. If the judge made some temporary orders, then um, the judge would also assign it for a date. And generally the date is within 14 days. However, if there was an indication on the application, that there were weapons or ammunition or even a permit available to the respondent, the hearing would have to be within seven days. The paperwork, um, you know, if there's orders entered or if there are no orders entered, that a hearing has to be set down. The paperwork then would go to the applicant or to the advocate or to an attorney, and it has to go to a marshal. It has to be served on the um, respondent at least, I believe it's three days prior to the hearing date. So that would be the next step in the process. And uh, um, Safe Connect is available once they assist with the application process. If the documents do get sent back to Safe Connect or any of our advocates at the local program, they will contact the survivor um, to explain what the court had ordered, whether it was just um, the hearing date or an ex parte, um, and then assist with if the survivor wanted to move forward with the process, um, coordinating the service with marshals. Um, we know sometimes that um, a court may only issue um, a hearing date, and if the applicant still resides with the respondent, that might not be a safe um, a safe, a safe option for them to pursue with having the service made and still having the hearing. Uh, are there other options that might be available then for a survivor? Yes. So in those kinds of, and this is why, you know, we encourage survivors to work with advocates or lawyers who are well versed in the restraining order process because there are alternatives and options and there are safety concerns. If you have an applicant who's still residing with the respondent and the, there's no relief granted, the respondent hasn't been ordered by the court to leave the house or have no contact with the applicant, the applicant has a decision to make there. Does he or she wanna go forward with that and then have to potentially reside in the same house with the respondent until the hearing date? Um, does the respondent want, or the applicant wanna go forward and maybe leave the, the residence himself or herself, or do they want to 
drop it and maybe may pursue protection some other way. Possibly in a divorce case, they can file for exclusive use of the home. Um, there's a lot of considerations to be made there. We know that once respondents have been served, there, there is a risk of escalation of the behavior. And these are all things that are concerning to us as um, attorneys and advocates. And that's why those are, that's a decision that the applicant has to make, but they should make it with the expertise and advice of an advocate. Thank you. Um, so what happens when you, you mentioned, so then the marshal has to serve the respondent, notifying them of the hearing date and if there is an ex parte, uh, whatever orders are in the court's order. Um, it, what if the marshal can't make service? Oftentimes we'll hear, you know, somebody might be trying to evade service. If the marshal cannot make service, if the applicant doesn't know where the respondent is, um, the applicant can ask for another 14 days to get the service made. Um, sometimes it's possible that the marshal can, you know, call the respondent and say, hey, I'm trying to serve you, um, meet me. Sometimes the marshal may try serving the respondent on a family member's house. I mean, there's different ways to try to make service if in hand service is not an option. Enhanced service is the best option because then we know the exact moment the respondent was served and we know that it, they were served. Um, but there are other ways and, you know, last case scenario is no service. You ask the, the applicant can ask for, and there's a particular form available online on judicial to ask for another 14 days to make the service. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the papers. When an applicant is filling out the papers and filling out their statement, the statement is the part of the application that goes to the judge, that tells the judge in the applicant's own words what happened, what transpired to bring this applicant to the court asking for protection. So it's important that the applicant um, you know, articulate those reasons for the judge and, and really bring home to the judge on this piece of paper, in their own words, why they need protection, why they're afraid. The flip side of it is that the applicant also needs to understand that statement and all the papers are going to be served on the respondent. And um, sometimes the applicant doesn't understand that when they, they the, you know, a cop, a police officer may say, Go, you need to go file for a restraining order, but the applicant doesn't know what the process is. So they need to understand whatever put, they put in those papers is going to get served on the respondent. And it's also a public document. That file is not available online, but should someone want to see what was put in the application in the statement, they can go to the clerk's office and read it. So it's important for applicants to know that because this is a very private and personal matter for them. And that may factor into their decision on what they put in the papers and whether they even file or not. So that, you know, is important. Once the marshal serves it, then, you know, if they have notice, they can go forward with the hearing. If there's no service, they can apply for the 14 day extension. And that, that form is available on judicial as well. So again, I think, uh, you know, what I'm hearing when you're saying that is, you know, again, it, the importance of working with either an advocate, safe connect coordinator or an attorney, because there may be some things that they don't want to include in the affidavit or might not have to um, that are very personal, um, where they can include other pieces and still um, might be able to obtain the restraining order. Is that yeah. correct? Yes, yes. There are, th th those are all, you know, that is all information that an, an applicant needs to take into consideration when they're filling out the forms. And, you know, an advocate or an attorney who's familiar with restraining orders is going to help them decide what to put in the papers and what other information a judge may need in the statement to put this particular incident that happened into context. Um, for instance, an applicant may have a history of domestic violence with the respondent. The respondent, this may not be the first thing that has happened. However, this thing that is now sending an applicant into the court 
filing for a restraining order may seem very insignificant if the applicant doesn't give the court the history, the context. So if an applicant says, you know, my ex-husband drove by my house the other night and he shouldn't be there and I'm afraid, that's not going to help a judge make a decision in the applicant's favor. But if the applicant says, I've been divorced from my ex-husband for five years, he served, you know, X sentence for assaulting me, um, he has no reason to be in this particular town driving by my house. Those kinds of things put the incident into context and are, help the judge to understand why the applicant came in. And those are the kinds of things that an advocate or an attorney who does restraining order work can help an applicant with. Okay. Karen, is there any what could be put into, sorry, Liza, we were gonna say something? All right, yep, I was gonna say, we did have a question come in um, from one of the viewers. Um, I think Lorraine already answered the second half of this question, but it's a two, it's a two part question. Um, what is the average turnaround time for a restraining order to take effect? And can an applicant get an extension of the temporary restraining order? Um, which I think Lorraine yes. already, already touched on that 14 day extension of service cannot be made. Um, but those, those were the two questions. So um, could you repeat that? Because I, I forgot the first part. I don't, have, uh, I don't have very much memory capacity, obviously. Um, what is the average turnaround time for a restraining order to take effect? OK, so that's a very good question. And I'm glad whoever asked that asked it. The restraining order is not effective until it's served on the respondent. So generally speaking, an applicant may apply for a restraining order today, and they did it you know, in the morning, and the court will turn it around and get it back to them by the end of the day. And then the, the applicant or the advocate or the attorney turns it over to a marshal. That restraining order is not effective against the respondent until service is made. So the marshal has, um, I don't know, about, 11 days or something to make the service. So the turnaround time before the restraining order is effective could be 11 days, that that order, even though the judge granted it, is not actually effective against the respondent because it hasn't been served. And then if it hasn't been served and you come back into court and need another 14 days, it's still not effective. Now, should in the meantime, while that respondent doesn't have actual or physical knowledge of the restraining order, the respondent does something that is in violation of the order, I would encourage the applicant to call the police and maybe that's how the respondent will get notice is that they violated the police contact him. So um, does that sort of answer the question, do you think, Liza? And the second part of the question was, all, was what? The extension. So the court, um, after the 14-day hearing, the court will make a ruling on whether to extend the restraining order further or not. The court has the authority to extend it up to a year. And so, you know, after the 14 days, it can be extended for a year. And during that year, if things continue to happen or the applicant continues to be in fear, when it comes close to the expiration date of that restraining order, say a year from now, um, a few weeks beforehand, that applicant should consider filing for another extension, doing the paperwork, um, having notice be given to the respondent, and it could be potentially extended for another year. And an advocate can help with that process or an attorney to file for that um, yeah. motion to extend. And uh, survivors typically get notice um, from the Office of Victim Services. Um, there's notice that will go out that the, or from the court, that the um, going to be for Lorraine. I'm I had a little glitch there. So, okay. What can a survivor expect at the hearing? Okay, and I just saw there was someone who mentioned that the restraint, the, the applicant should be notified when service is made. Um, 
I don't know if all marshals do that, but they should be doing that. The applicant should know. So um, what can be expected at the restraining order hearing? Well, um, you know, the applicant is going to have to go to court and the respondent may appear and there is going to be, um, these days right now, as we know the world to be, the applicant would appear at court and generally the marsh, a marshal will take the applicant's phone number, cell phone number, and have the applicant wait outside so that social distancing is um, being um, adhered to. And then someone from family relations would call the applicant and speak to the applicant about the the affidavit, the statement, whether they want to go forward. They would let the applicant know if the respondent had appeared or not. Um, they would do a risk assessment for the applicant, the, app, the respondent, which tells the judge um, on a number system how much of a risk, you know, low, medium, high risk the um, respondent appears to be to the applicant. And then the applicant, and if the respondent is there, would be heard by the judge. And the applicant, in preparation for that, should get together any um, any information, any evidence, any exhibits that the applicant wants the judge to be aware of, be it text messages or videos or um, emails or um, voicemails that the judge needs to be aware of in order to make this decision about the risk that the applicant is um, under. And at court, does the um, victim meet with anyone, survivor meet with anyone at court? Um, well, in, in the, in the pre-pandemic days, the, the survivor would meet with a family relations officer and explain in person what happened, why they need this order. At this point, the family relations is not physically meeting with, to the best of my knowledge, with um, survivors, with applicants. They are talking to them over the phone. I do understand that in some courts, the family relations people may talk to them um, through plexiglass, but I haven't heard a lot of reports of that. I hear more about the phone contact. I also want to point out if the applicant um, has an extreme fear of the respondent and um, you know gets to court and the marshal says you have to wait outside. Now the applicant's thinking the respondent may show up and this is not going to be a good situation for them both to be hanging around court waiting to get to be heard. So the applicant should make the the marshal aware that he or she is there for a restraining order hearing and that they need some protection. They need to be brought inside the courtroom and maybe wait in a conference room or something. And an advocate can help. If, if you're working with an advocate, a survivor can certainly work with an advocate um, to make the court aware of any safety concerns the day of the hearing um, and any uh, accommodations that might be needed um, so that the survivor is not waiting outside in the same area as the, as the respondent. Right. Um, and when the court, um, do, you, do you suggest that the survivor carry a copy of the order with them? Yes. Once yes. Once the court enters an order, um, whether it's the, the ex parte order or if the order is extended after the 14-day um, hearing, the survivor should keep a copy with him or her. Um, maybe these days, take a picture of it and have it on your phone if that's easier. Um, provide it to anyone who should have a copy such as um, if the survivor is in school and doesn't want the applicant or the respondent coming to the school or being on the school, school grounds, provide it to the school. If the restraining order extends to children, have the children's school know about it, have the daycare know about it, have the babysitter know about it, have a family member know about it, give them a copy so that um, should the respondent turn up and you know, want to have contact with the children and it's in violation, violation of the order that the, um, that the daycare provider or the school or the babysitter have knowledge of it and they can show something to the police if it comes to that. Okay. And yeah, is it correct? Sorry, I'm so, sorry, I'm gonna just jump in again. Um, it kind of related to what Lauren was just saying. We did have a viewer note that 
um, once the restraining order is granted, the clerk is supposed to fax that order off to the police departments um, in the towns where the applicants and respondents live and work. Um, so that those police departments are aware that the restraining order is in place. Um, we did also have two more questions um, come in. So this, this is the first one. Is a victim notified when the TRO is served? Again, the victim sometimes is notified, sometimes is not. If the, um, if you ask the marshal to do that and you give the marshal the phone number to do that, generally they do do it. If I am working with a victim and I ask the marshal, I say to the marshal, I need to know when it's served, they generally will let me know. But sometimes, you know, I've seen it that the applicant may drop the papers off at the court, goes back and picks it up. At the courts, we have something called marshal for the day, just as the marshal who is assigned to the court that day to um, take papers and serve them. So, on the paperwork, there generally is not an, a contact number for the applicant. So unless the applicant talks to the marshal and says, here's my contact information, or what I really um, strongly suggest applicants do is get the marshal's card and then contact the marshal, follow up with the marshal to do make the service. So yes and no. Sometimes the marshals do make the contact and say it was served, but I'm not confident in saying most of the time or all the time. Okay. And the same thing when a survivor is working with an, with an advocate. An advocate can be that go-between because they're helping to coordinate the service with the marshal. They can also um, sometimes get notification from the marshal that the service was made. There is a, uh, two judicial forms on the judicial website um, for the marshals um, when the papers are being delivered to the marshal to be served or sent to the marshal to be served. There is a respondent profile sheet that the um, it's really important that the survivor or applicant uh, complete with as much information about the respond that they can so that the marshal can find and locate that person to make service, a description, what kind of car they might drive, a license plate. Um, and it also has on the second um, judicial form for the marshals, um, a line where the applicant can write down the marshal's name and telephone number and contact them directly. Um, there's also uh, advocates or victim survivors can do it themselves, sign up on CT7. Um, uh, for notification, marshals are supposed to, when they make service, enter into the judicial system that service was made so that a survivor can get notice. I will say though, as Lorraine was mentioning, that doesn't always happen. Um, so you still might want to confirm by phone. Right, so, and it, I, it's a bit difficult to get the seven notification on a restraining order because those cases are not um, public. So I'm not quite sure how easy it is to, to get that notification set up. Um, but I do encourage applicants to, or their advocates or attorneys to get the marshal information to follow up because first of all, you wanna know when it was served. And second of all, you wanna know that service was made and so that you have the, the proof of service when you go to court. It happens all the time that the the marshal may have sent the proof of service over to the court or it didn't show up at the court yet and the, the applicant shows up and the judge says, I can't do anything with this because I have no proof of service. So then the applicant or the advocate or the attorney is running around trying to get that, um, no, that proof of service. I also wanna point out that um, the applicant or the advocate, the attorney, if the applicant has a picture of the respondent or information on where the respondent is working and what hours, a license plate, a car, um, anything that helps the, the marshal find the respondent. Because as we've already discussed, many times the respondent's in the wind and the applicant doesn't know where the respondent is staying. But if the respondent is going to work, serve them there. If he um, hangs out a particular place, I've had a, I had a marshal up in the, the Litchfield area who hung out at a Burger King for me and served the, mar served the respondent on a Sunday night because he, he saw his car and whatever. So there's all sorts of ways to get service and the, the, hard, or the more likely it is for the respondent to not be staying at their residence or going to work, the more information the marshal should have. All right, thank you so much, Lorraine. Um, 
the second question was, does Connecticut have lifetime restraining orders? This is a term this person has heard used before, but wasn't sure if they actually exist. So that's also a good question. They, in criminal court, I have heard of judges entering um, lifetime protective orders or protective orders that extend to 2074 or something. In family court, 46 v 15 restraining orders, it used to not, it used to be kind of common to see judges make lifetime restraining orders. It's unclear to me now whether there were some changes in the statute, whether the judge, I believe the judges still have the authority to make those kinds of orders. It's very rare to see a judge in family court make a lifetime restraining order. I have heard about it rarely. I heard about it not too long ago, and I was surprised because things have changed over the time I've been practicing, and it's not common to hear of a lifetime restraining order. More common to hear of a lifetime criminal protective order. Oh, did you have any other question, Liza, before I? Okay. Um, Lorraine, I, I know we hear a lot of times survivors, especially again during COVID, um, they ask about is there an option to have a remote or a virtual hearing? And I know the judicial branch has made some accommodations in some criminal um, areas, um, the criminal court um, and some family court processes, but, um, but how about for restraining orders? What are, what are we looking at with that right now? So under the restraining order statute, a victim has the um, ability to ask for a remote hearing. They've had that ability for about 10 years from what I remember. Um, I've had people ask for them in the past and very, very rarely was such an accommodation ever made, partly because the courts just didn't have the, the technology and the, the ability to, to, to do those types of hearings. Um, as things have progressed over the years, some of the courts have done, um, made great strides in having the capabilities. Uh, we now see in some of the court um, judicial districts, respondents or defendants don't get um, brought to court for hearings in family cases. They just get videoed in from the correctional facilities. So we have made strides. That being said, um, right now, restraining order cases are not just routinely being set down for hearings, other fam or remote hearings, other family cases are. Um, so should an should a applicant want to ask for that, they can. There are some considerations that the applicant has to consider. Um, first of all, their safety, um, you know, their health, do they want to go to court? But they have to balance that with the possibility that they're going to get a remote hearing granted and it's going to be telephonic. Um, or, you know, it's even more complicated because they have an interpreter that they need to use in order to converse with the judge. So those things make it more difficult for a judge to really get a good read on the applicant if it's telephonic or if it's through an interpreter. Um, we also have concerns about in restraining order cases, the applicant, first of all, if they don't want to disclose their location, they, have, they should not be having a remote hearing from that undisclosed location. But, you know, where are they going to have this remote hearing from if it gets granted? Home, um, do, they have, do they have really solid Wi-Fi? Do they have the equipment they need? You know, what's going to be going on in the background if they have young kids or are going to be running around that are going to distract from their hearing or they're speaking with the judge. So these are all concerns that need to be balanced by an applicant before they make such a request. Thank you. Um, any um, suggestions for, for survivors to prepare for a hearing? Yes. Um, get to court early, first of all, um, especially if they believe the respondent may show up and they are, you know, we have different levels of threats and fear and I rely on the applicant to tell me how likely is it that the respondent may show up and what might the respondent do if they do show up. So we like the applicants to get there early, um, try to get inside or to try to get the detention of a marshal so that they're 
um, protected if they need that protection. Um, they, again, if there's documents or videos or recordings that they want to present to the court to um, fully um, educate the judge on what has transpired, they should have that. Um, you know, we discourage applicants or, you know, just um, our clients in any type of family case for bringing children to court with them. So those are the kinds of things. And they need to, the applicant needs to think in advance about what they are going to say to the judge to, you know, get across what has been going on that has led them to take this step. What does the judge need to hear? Again, we go back to what the statute says, a continuous threat of present physical pain or physical injury, um, a pattern of stalking, those kinds of things. So, you know, an applicant needs to prepare themselves for the stress of court. It's an incredibly stressful experience, especially if the respondent appears. Sometimes the respondent appears and brings his or her entire family. It's intimidating. Um, the applicant if they're in court and there's other people in court they have to tell this very personal story in front of those other people um, so they need to think about what they're going to say and they need to just prepare for that along with the um, the evidentiary um, materials they want to bring and of course, too, the judicial branches um, notifies individuals coming to the court that uh, they are practicing social distancing um, and masks are required at court. Um, I think from what you know, advocates are reporting that when the hearings do occur and in, uh, survivors are going into court for the hearing, those are being handled differently across the state in some situations an applicant might be placed in one small conference room and the respondent in another and there there's video equipment or a telephone into the courtroom with the judge um in other situations we've been told that um the court will allow one party in the courtroom at the same time so the the applicant will be coming in talking to the judge leave and the respondent comes in um, so again, even just checking in with your local domestic violence program to find out um, how are restraining order hearings happening or your attorney and how they're happening, happening in your local court um, would be really important to prepare as well so you don't get, I think, shocked or stunned. Yes, and things are changing almost daily. You know, courts have opened up, practices have changed. One judge may have one way of doing things in a particular court and another judge in that same court may do it differently. So, um, you know, ask, see what people have to say about what has happened recently. And if you're hearing about what happened two months ago and it was a nightmare, take that with a grain of salt because things have evolved. I've been in court on restraining order cases. Um, you know, there were very few people waiting outside I was expecting a lot of people. It was a busy court. It was a criminal court. That didn't happen. Um, there was no one else in the courtroom but my client and myself when we went in. But I've heard other stories. So, you know, things are changing frequently. And um, I wouldn't want somebody to not apply for a restraining order because of the concerns about what court may be like. But they also need to be prepared that, you know, what someone else's experience was may not be what their experience and i also want to mention i think you mentioned this yes people are wearing um masks in court so that's a that's a necessity so we started off today talking about you know restraining orders being one one tool in the toolbox one um option for survivors um but would you say that a restraining order is for everyone no no, I wouldn't say it's for everyone. I think that um, frequently what we see, not frequently, but occasionally we see um, applicants come to us who have already done the application process and got a hearing date or they're considering it. And based on the information that they present to us, I may say, I don't, I don't think this is the best option for you. There's other options. It may be, um, there's a divorce case going on and maybe the applicant really just needs to get the respondent out of the house. So instead of a restraining order, maybe what they need is to file in the divorce case, for instance, a motion for exclusive possession. Um, sometimes, you know, my feeling is when I, when I talk to the applicant, 
my feeling is, and again, I'm not a judge and I never tell anybody they can't apply for a restraining order, but that they're not going to prevail. You know, again, we talked about that concern about applying for a restraining order and not getting any ex parte relief. Um, we also have concerns about applicants filing and then going to a hearing and not prevailing at the hearing, which may embolden the respondent to up the behaviors escalate. Um, sometimes the applicant, you know, really is looking for financial orders. That's so that would be a custody case or a, a child support case or a divorce case. So there are alternatives. It's again, fact specific to what's going on between the applicant and the respondent. And, um, you know, there's no one size fits all here. Right. So, and we mentioned too uh, earlier about pr the different protective orders, civil protective order, criminal protective order, restraining order. Um, sometimes a victim may have a protective order in place and a restraining order may still be an appropriate thing for them to pursue. Is that correct or? Yes, that is absolutely correct. First of all, if there's a criminal protective order in place, the applicant should disclose that in the, the paperwork, the, the statement or the application. If there um, hasn't been an arrest, but possibly there was a warrant, there's a warrant out. So there isn't a protective order in place yet because the respondent hasn't been picked up. That should be in the uh, statement that there's an arrest warrant or that they contacted the police, the police are investigating. Those kinds of things should go in the statement. But the, the thing about a criminal protective order is that criminal case is between the state of Connecticut and the respondent slash defendant. The applicant may have some input into that case and um, frequently we see that input is, um, is bolstered when they have a criminal court advocate working with them. So, but that case, they don't control that case. They have some input into it, but in most, in most cases when that criminal case ends, so does that protective order. And that protective order may not extend to children, but it should, all those kinds of things. So in those cases, we do encourage um, survivors to file for a restraining order because they're the applicant, they're like the plaintiff in a divorce case, or they have more control over that case. And that case will have a definite date that the restraining order ends. In the criminal case, you know, the case may go on and on and on for a very long time. And so the protective order stays in place in the criminal case. But if the, uh, de the defendant um, pleads out or does a program, the case ends, it's disposed of, and most times, so does the protective order, it's disposed of as well. So it's very important that an applicant understands the difference between a criminal protective order and a um, 46B15 protective order that enters in family court and um, you know, makes that decision for themselves about going forward. So, and you mentioned, so the criminal protective order obviously can go away at any time or the restraining order, um, and the restraining order also gives additional protections that the criminal protective order may not, such as custody, temporary custody of children. Yes, okay. yes. the criminal protective order may say no contact with the children, but it's not going to give someone custody and it's not going to, um, you know, occasionally maybe there's, you know, visitation through a third party or something put in a criminal protective order. But it's the, the focus of that criminal protective order is for the protection of the victim and not to deal with those other kind of ancillary issues. Unless the children were exposed victims. to the, the violence or they were victims. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of variables there. And again, um, the victim needs to be aware of what the terms are of the criminal protective order. Sometimes I find that the, criminal, the, the victim hasn't gotten a copy of it yet. They're telling me there's a criminal, but we don't know what it is. And I, as an attorney without an appearance in that criminal case, I can't get it. I can't find it out. So, um, you know, we'll go forward with the, the, the family court restraining order because we want to know exactly what the protections are and what the expiration date is going to be. Um, Liza, do you have more questions? Yeah. 
Um, so we just had a viewer um, just looking for, maybe you could just very briefly explain the difference between a family violence restraining order and a civil protection order. So the family violence uh, restraining order being 46B15 and the civil protection order being 46B16A, the order that is for sexual assault and stalking victims. Okay, so hold on one second. Let me make sure that I, I have notes on that because I, I wanna make sure I get that right. Um, so we have the criminal protective order, then we have the 46B15 order which is the family court order. And that is for um, victims of a continuous threat of present physical pain, physical danger um, by somebody who is defined under the statute as a family member. And we, we talked about that. It's the dating relationship. It's a roommate. It's somebody that you've lived with, have children with, were married to, related by blood or marriage. Then 46B 16A is different. 46B15, the court is not concerned so much about whether there's a criminal protective order. You can have both. You can have a family court restraining order, 46B15, and a criminal order. 46B16A is for victims of sexual assault or stalking, and it is for those victims who do, do not have the family relationship with the respondent and in which there is no criminal protective order. If there's a criminal protective order, if someone has been the victim of a sexual assault, sexual abuse, stalking, but there has been an arrest made and a criminal protective order and that um, respondent, that defendant is not a family member or there's no relationship there that puts them under 4615, if there's that criminal protective order, they cannot get an order under 46B16A. I'm not sure if I was clear about that. Any yeah, other questions, Liza? I think, I think that answers the question. I'll, uh, we'll see if, if they have another question, but I think you answered the question, Lorraine. Thank you. I also want to go back to, I kind of skipped over it, that victims who apply or survivors apply for a 46B15 order can ask the court for financial orders. Um, the financial orders they can ask, um, there's a form that has to be filled out. It's the JD, um, or I think it's JD FM 233, but they can ask for if the applicant, the respondent or spouses, or they are people who live together with dependent children in common. Um, and the orders are necessary to maintain safety and basic needs and there's no other four financial orders that exist, the court can enter um, orders along the lines of prohibiting the termination of utilities or necessary services related, related to a dwelling. They can um, prevent the respondent from canceling insurance, health, automobile, or homeowners um, from um, transferring property. Or, and they can also order that the respondent turn over things like checkbook, documents, keys, a car. So um, we find that uh, survivors less frequently ask for the financial orders. Those financial orders are good for up to 120 days. They can't be modified. Um, they have to be, to, in order to keep them going after 120 days, they have to be transferred into a divorce or custody case. But I just want to make sure people are aware that if they need those orders, there's a method in the restraining order process to ask for them. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Liza, did you want to, you're gonna to touch base about um, resources or did you want me to? Oh, I can do it. So okay. um, thank you again, Jerry and Lorraine, um, for having this important discussion and explaining a bit about how um, restraining orders are accessed here in Connecticut. Um, we do always like to close out our uh, Facebook Live conversations um, just with some contact information for how to get help here in Connecticut. Um, so again, Safe Connect is Connecticut's um, domestic violence resource hub. So this is the one you know, point of access to get help here in Connecticut. Um, all of our services are confidential, safe, free, and voluntary. Um, bilingual services are available. And once the Safe Connect advocate has discussed your immediate needs with you, they're gonna get you, make that safe connection for you to your local domestic violence organization which is one of CCADV's 18 member organizations 
that will provide that ongoing local support um, wherever you live. Um, you can call, text, chat, or email with Safe Connect advocates 24 hours a day um, by either visiting ctsafeconnect.org or calling or texting 888-774-2900. Um, these are our 18 member organizations. They're located all across the state and they have advocates ready to help 24 hours a day as well. Um, and if you have any questions about our presentation today, please don't hesitate to email Jerry at gwild at ctcadv.org. Um, so thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. Have a good one. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you.